Hey, 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 hey on a prayer. Oh, hey, hey, Ying, uh, you caught me warming up for this one. I see that I'm not the only one who's feeling musical this week. What was that? Well, that's my go-to karaoke song, "Living on a Prayer" by Bon Jovi. It's an American rock classic, and it brings down the house if you nail it. At least back home. <laughs> Good to know. Today we will talk all about KTV, which is what China calls karaoke, and its role in cementing social bonds after a successful business dinner or as a night out with friends. We'll discuss its origins, how it spread to China, and the different ways in which people enjoy it today. And since this is Friday's show, we will look back at a few things we have learned earlier this week and tie it all together. I can't wait. Welcome back. So, although karaoke has ebbed and flowed in terms of popularity in the U.S. for decades, and it's been a mainstay of entertainment in China for almost as long, it actually started elsewhere, right? That's right. Karaoke first started in Japan during the 1980s. It was an outgrowth of the competitive corporate culture. In Japanese society, there was a feeling that every man should be at the office very late working or out entertaining clients. I understand that a man who came home early, meaning right after standard business hours, was viewed with suspicion as maybe not working hard enough. Yes, but of course, not everyone's job was the same. Some men didn't have clients to meet or work to do after hours, so they went to bars instead to pass the time. These bars were boring, with just TVs to keep people occupied. Then someone got the idea to add a jukebox that you could sing along with, and karaoke was born. Karaoke spread to the U.S. on a separate path than it did to China. It came to China by way of Taiwan, where it seems to have picked up its Chinese characteristics. In the West, karaoke is usually done on one central stage where everyone watches. Different groups of people are all in the same big room, watching and waiting for their turn on that same one microphone. But in China, it's a very different system and experience, and it's hugely popular. How is it unique, and how big is it here, Yingying? KTV is the number one form of group entertainment among Chinese. If you understand society and culture here, you will better understand the local variety of karaoke that developed in China, and why it's so popular. First of all, at a KTV, there are many individual rooms to allow for different groups to have their privacy, and have a group bonding experience. KTV is a truly social form of networking, and it's also a great way to learn about each other in a safer environment. It does seem very well suited to the Chinese temperament. You can probably figure out more about someone's tastes and age and family background based on their song selections at KTV than from their resume. Right, picking the top pop songs of today can show everyone your youthful spirit, while choosing classic Chinese songs from older generation singers might show your age. But it can also just be a great way to make the boss and everyone else happy by picking a song that everyone knows and can sing along with. I know that KTV can also be a great way to extend your social circle too if you're just out with friends. If everyone in your group invites one other new friend to the KTV, pretty soon you'll have doubled your fun with minimal effort. But besides fun and networking, it has other benefits too. It does. Chinese people also work really hard. We will talk more about work practice here on future episodes. And KTV is a really great way to relieve some of the pressures and stress from our crazy schedule. Nine nine six, probably heard about it. Being a mic king or queen for a night can do wonders for your mental health. It lets you release passions and emotions that are usually buried deep inside in a way that is socially acceptable. It's an old cliche that Asians are more introverted, but pretty much every Asian I've talked to says there's a lot of truth to that. Now, letting yourself be expressive at KTV can be a great way to impress a date, also, right? KTV can be a place to generate a little romance. A guy might invite a girl to sing along with him, or vice versa. Maybe they find out that they can make all kinds of great music together. You also learn a lot about someone's social abilities in a business setting. Someone who just sits there and eats the food all by themselves and doesn't sing or drink with everyone isn't likely to be a leader in the company anytime soon. Ah,、uh, you got it. It's sad that some people just don't know how to strike up a conversation, but KTV can help bring even the most reluctant person out of their shell. All they have to do is show up and be encouraged to give it a try. It's become so popular precisely because it's so effective at building relationships. As we wrap it up, I'll say that there are several common types of KTV situations that I'm aware of or familiar with. If you'd like to add something to this list, please write us and let us know, and we'll talk about it on a later episode. But for now, maybe the most common thing that you're going to see is a mixed group of friends—men and women, boys and girls—all just having fun and being very casual. 
The next one is a mixed of group of business people who want to use KTV as a chance to impress each other with how socially savvy they are. You also see people who are all from a specific company at KTV, who are there as part of the team building exercise, which is a hybrid of these first two. And we'd be sweeping something under the rug if we didn't tell you or warn you that is about one other scenario that you might see at a KTV also, which is a men-only group that's a little raunchier than the corporate or mixed groups. Now, I know there are female-only groups who also raise hell at KTV, but in some cases, the male version of this is about as close to the VIP section of a Western strip club as you're going to see in China. And sometimes there's apparently a so-called takeaway option on the table with some of the bar hostesses too in some of the less reputable clubs outside the major cities. That is. Is, at least from what I understand. I'm shocked and have no official comments. <laughs> well, I know you are a good Chinese girl, Ying Ying, so please don't feel the need to comment. And I'm not saying that some KTVs are where businessmen find hookers in order to woo clients or maybe blackmail a competitor, but... Well, that's actually exactly what I'm saying. Okay, enough about that. The main thing to remember here is that KTV is mostly a very wholesome, family or company-friendly environment, and a lot tamer than many of the typical after-hours activities in the West. It's fun for everyone, and now I want to go. Well, we better find a song that we both know how to sing first, unless I can teach you a little Bon Jovi. Want it? A dead or alive? <laughs> All right, that'll work. Let's wrap this up and get out of here. So this week we have covered a lot of subjects related to the Chinese business dinner and a lot more. We've looked at how and where to sit, the ways to connect at the dinner, how to drink and toast, and drink some more. We learned about the origins of that drinking culture, which we'll come back to again in the series, as well as ways to show respect and display good manners while you eat. Today we covered KTV and all its main permutations, and how to build your relationships up while letting your hair down. Next week we'll work to crack the Chinese communications code in a deeper way, looking at how such topics as modesty. Humility and hierarchy affect the negotiations of all kinds. We'll examine how humor does and doesn't translate, the relative value of contracts in a Chinese business context, and much, much more. I'm Yingyi, and I'm Brendan Davis. See you next week on How China Works. Yeah.